We wanna hear the stories from the courses that you've taught. Whether in a lab, a classroom, kitchen, on Zoom or in a shop. Drawing on your expertise, we'll ask the probing questions. What goes right and what goes wrong when teaching your favorite lesson? Welcome back, everybody, to my favorite lesson. This is a podcast series hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, and I'll be your host. And I am lucky enough today to be here with Trisha Dumay, who is a faculty member in Conestoga's Early Childhood Education Program. Good morning, Trisha. Good morning, Lauren. How are you today? Great, thanks. Thank you so much for being here. Um, why don't we start off, if you could just let me know a little bit um, about your experience at the college. How long have you been with Conestoga? What do you teach? Sure. I started at the college part-time in 2009 in the Early Childhood Education Program, and I've been there uh, full-time. I became full-time in 2011, but okay. last year I had a prepaid leave, so I was off. So about 11 years I've been here. Lovely. That's mm -hmm. a, a great amount of time. And um, I mean, I think anyone listening probably hears about early childhood education in the news. It's often a political <laughs> sort of issue, and and so I would imagine in in that slightly more than a decade, there's been some evolution in the program or sort of principles or, you know, different expectations that students might face upon graduating. Over this time, are there certain things that you've that stand out to you that you've really seen change in terms of pedagogy, political climate, anything? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the political climate is shifting. The student demographic is um, the same. I think there's a demand that's consistent for early childhood education. It's mm -hmm. a popular program, and it's a really great time to be entering the program as there's more and more initiatives that would benefit students and professionals in early learning. Ah, and what, what do you mean? What are some of those initiatives? Well, we're seeing a little bit uh, of advocacy that's resulting in government initiatives for wage enhancements. Mm. And I anticipate, we're hopeful, all of us as a profession, that that will mean uh, fair wages. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, let's hope. Yes, there is hope. <laughs> before mm -hmm. before we started recording, um, the, our technician is helping us here. Jesse and I were just talking about, yeah, the transition back to school after maternity leave and, um, yeah, the different definitions of work, right? And, and it's so bizarre. I think those of us who are parents um, really recognize how, <laughs> how much labor is involved in caring for and loving and helping educate our little people. Um, and, you know, my personal opinion is it's, uh, it's really too bad that that's not reflected in fair wages all mm -hmm. the time. Absolutely. When I was off for a year, one of the things that I did was working with children, directly with children and families uh, for about seven months. And uh, I was reminded just mm. what hard work it is. I had been in the field for about 20 years before joining Conestoga's team, but it's, it's work that really deserves to be recognized with fair wages. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and so what are, what are the courses that you tend to teach within the program at Conestoga? Mm -hmm. Because I've been with the team for so long, I've taught most all types of courses, so curriculum courses. We have a health, safety, and nutrition course and some advocacy professionalism courses. But I tend to be assigned and appreciate and enjoy the curriculum courses the most. Mm. And uh, health, safety, and nutrition, philosophy, and practice, and curriculum courses is what I'm teaching right now. Oh, those are beautiful titles. Yes, I agree. <laughs> the philosophy and practice in particular. I imagine, yeah. It's yeah. Great fun. What, what sort of things are encompassed in that course? Well, it's the course where students begin to strengthen their own professional philosophies and mm -hmm. look to agencies to see which professional, which um, program statements are aligned with their own philosophies so that they might find work that's aligned with their own values. So they strengthen their understanding of what they're looking for what they want to be in the lives of children and families. Mm -hmm. And um, we do look at, you know, philosophers and theorists that would have informed their practice, curriculum approaches and models that might align with their own. So it's, a, it's an exciting course. We also can talk about contemporary issues as they come up. So, 
you know, the relevance of chat GPT and mm -hmm. early childhood education and how it might be utilized or as you were talking about earlier, the shifts in politics, those sorts of things can come up in our conversations in that course. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, it is. And I mean, any any parent who's looked for a preschool or daycare for their <laughs> for their little ones, I'm sure is, you know, sort of bombarded with different approaches. And it, it's it's really hard to know what's right, even, you know, if you're pretty clear in your own parenting philosophy, when you're handing care over to, to others, it's, it's tricky. And there there is in some ways a, a bit of an abundance of choice. Do you find over the years, have you um, been able to sort of clarify your own teaching philosophy? Absolutely. I think I had been in the field working with young children and families for uh, almost 20 years, so I had a sense, a, a very clear sense of my own teaching philosophy, which was constructivism, that mm -hmm. I viewed, you know, children and families as partners in learning, and that's translated beautifully. All of those skills that I utilized, strength, and over the years actually served me very well teaching in the college with adult learners because it's the same principles that inform my practice. Yeah, oh, that's so nicely put. And I mean, um, certainly within teaching and learning, we're often reminding faculty that we do encourage a constructivist approach. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. You said, you know, at the core of it in early childhood education is, is kind of seeing children and families as partners. How might that manifest? Um, you know, when thinking about a child care setting, what, what would that look like? Well, consulting with children and families and colleagues to establish, you know, policies. And uh, I mean, that begins with the program statement, ideally. But in the classroom with my colleagues, a simple example might be if we had a budget. So a regular budget might be assigned to a classroom for petty cash and that we might sit with four-year-olds and say, we have $50 this <laughs> month. What do you think we might do with this $50? And they'd have, you know, different ideas about what that could be used for. Aww. So that's one example. I'd like to hear those ideas, yes, actually. <laughs> yes, they had uh, really great, wonderful ideas. And the interesting thing is with children, I didn't really need to have a majority rules. We could come to a cons consensus, which is quite unique. With adults, it's a little bit more difficult to come to a consensus. But children would hear each other out and say, you're right. Yes, yes, let's do that. And they would be willing to compromise or uh, shift their thinking. Oh, interesting. So yeah, not a, a cut and dry vote of here are our three top options and everyone votes. They'd they'd consult and maybe mm -hmm. share ideas and try to convince each other. And certainly. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that sort of, um, you know, conversation honoring who all participants are in the learning process, I would say certainly translates to the adult education realm and post-secondary teaching. How do you bring this type of thing into your own classroom? I think we'd begin the semester as most faculty would by just establishing what do you need to uh, have this be a safe and positive learning environment. So we'd consult with students about that and they'd establish the guidelines alongside us. We would even check in about, you know, we have 30 minutes allocated for a three hour class of break time. When would you like that to happen? And for each section, it would be different. Some would say we want two 15 minute breaks, while others would say we'd like a half hour break. And so that would be established alongside students. Sometimes they might guide me in a developing evaluation. So I would say I'm developing an exam for this course. What sorts of things would be helpful for you to review the exam? So some sections might say they really appreciate cahoots, whereas another section would say, could we have a study guide? Or mm. um, some sections would say, would you mind highlighting the questions that you'll be focusing on for short answer questions? And so I jot those down and try to, as much as possible, incorporate those into my teaching for that particular section. That's so fascinating to me, I think, because... You know, oftentimes, especially faculty who've been teaching the same course again and again, might go into a semester thinking, well, this worked, you know, the past three years, mm -hmm. I'm just going to stick with it and, you know, tried and true, etc. But what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, if you're really taking a constructivist approach, then every group of students is very different and their needs are very different. And the, you know, the world they're living in from semester to semester could be very different. Um, and so honoring kind of who they are and where they're at and that they're 
old enough and intelligent enough to <laughs> know and voice their needs, mm-hmm. um, you know, in some ways seems kind of revolutionary when you consider what education has been, you know, over over the years. Yes, I suppose. But I, I think in our program in early childhood education, there is a tendency toward doing that, maybe because we're early childhood educators mm-hmm. and have been practicing those strategies for so long, they're intuitive to us. But each section is unique, and no semester year to year is the same. However, there is a predictability that each year I can present some options and students, there's a pattern in their responses, so what they need and what they want. I can, and I don't mean to say that I'm, you know, hoodwinking them or that, but I, I've already sort of established those. Mm-hmm. And then I say, well, that's great. I'll do that. But actually, it's already set in place because I knew they might say that because it works for students because right. I've seen over time that that's what students like and want. Mm. But there's a sense of being seen when we're consulting with them and making sure that um, the outcome is unique to their particular requests. But there is a predictability. So it's not as hard mm-hmm. as it seems just because they tell you what the same uh the same, they tell you the same thing year after year. Mm. Maybe that's the difference between kids who might have a response out from left field on how to how to spend that fifty dollars versus yes. adult learners. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit, a bit of a pattern there. Absolutely, there is a need for flexibility. Mm. Flexibility. There is a need to be willing to incorporate their ideas if we're going to mm. ask them. Yeah. So that's kind of, I guess, brave of my colleagues and I to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the lesson that you wanted to share with us today, if I'm correct, it has kind of constructivism at its core. Is that is that so? Yes, absolutely. It was hard for me to choose just Mm -hmm. one favorite lesson. But there's one that I've been doing for a number of years that does have constructivism at its core. Great. Well, Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more. Great. So maybe um, if you could let us know which course you usually use this in, maybe multiple courses, but um, which course or courses you share this lesson and maybe at what point in the semester you introduce it and then let us know what it is. Mm -hmm. So the course that I teach for this particular lesson is designing integrative curriculum. So it used to be perhaps when I went to school and maybe in your early education as well, we would learn mathematics at math time Mm -hmm. and we're shifting away from that in education where we're understanding and appreciating that education happens in a more natural and holistic way so we would integrate math with literacy and perhaps movement Mm -hmm. and we wanted to make sure that students had a strong understanding of constructivism to start with before we started introducing math and literacy and what children learn so we wanted to focus on how children learn And in order to highlight what constructivism is, I thought, well, why don't we model? We try to model a lot in our program, model relationships, model diversity, equity, and inclusion, or just model the way that we teach and inviting students to hopefully be inspired to do the same when they graduate and become early childhood educators. And so I had to think of something unfamiliar in order to illustrate how children learn, because um, you know, learning happens when you don't know something right. and, and it, it, it evolves to knowing something. And that learning, according to constructivism, happens following some principles that, you know, there's competent and capable individuals that mm. will learn through active participation. And so I thought, well, what don't they know? And that varies from student to student because they all come from different cultures and bring different knowledge. And some of them are smarter than we are in in certain subjects. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the grocery store on King Street. It's the new city supermarket. And it uh, specializes in foods that are unique and, you know, unfamiliar to me. It's an Asian food market. Okay. And so I just take the cart and I buy things that are most unfamiliar to me. And I assume that some of those will be unfamiliar to students as well. And at the back of the class, we have, a, you know, a number of tables. We have a really great active learning classroom with a lot of materials that are mm important for early childhood education. And I set up all of these unfamiliar food items on trays and I have some cutting boards and knives and I cover it up. And then we have a big reveal and students are invited to in groups and the groups are intentionally created 
I select the members of the group and they are invited to find out what those food items are. I don't even say food items. I just say, <laughs> what is it? And they go in the back and I said, but no Google. That's mm -hmm. the most important thing. We're not Googling. And so they go in the back and they, um, yeah, begin the journey to find out what it is. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so it's like kind of one sort of unfamiliar item that's cut up that they figure out. Or there's an array of different things. An array. So there's about four or five unfamiliar items per group on their tray. And wow. so it could be that one they know right away. They might say, oh, that's tamarind. I know that. And okay. that would be the end of it. So there's about four or five items per tray and there to find out what all of those are. And so what kind of processes do they use to figure this out in the moment? Mm -hmm. Well, just like children, when they're learning, they would utilize their senses. You know, they mm -hmm. say, can we, can we touch it? Can we taste it? Can mm -hmm. we smell it? I say, sure. And they say, is it food? And I say, well, I bought it at a grocery store, so <laughs> I, I think it is. I'm pretty sure that it is. And uh, people tried it this morning, and they're still alive, so I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, you know, there's a varying uh, degree of, a willingness to taste and to mm -hmm. smell. There are some students who are really keen. And that's the great thing. Then we can tie in their health, safety, and nutrition course that looks at not forcing children to eat foods that they're unfamiliar with, that mm -hmm. this would be the same for them as eating a food that they're seeing for the first time. Children mm -hmm. are going to child care and experiencing something similar. So we're reminding them of that. Wow. And they would taste it, smell it. They'd talk to each other. And the reason that I've intentionally created their groups rather than allowed them to select it is because we have some students that have more expertise with food that's unfamiliar to me, and that would be some of our international students. And this is a unique opportunity that they become the experts. And then you'll see them sort of consulting. I know what that is. That's tamarind. And that's just one example. There's many foods I still don't know what they are. But... Um, then they'd consult with each other sometimes, and then they'd write it on the board. So when somebody wrote it on the board, they might say, well, they know what it is. Why don't we go and ask them what it is? And they'd start to partner with each other and help each other realize what it is, what you do with it, how you eat it. Um, there was one instance where, I don't know the name of the food item, but a student said, we used to use this as nail polish because it dyes your skin. If you just oh hold my. it there for a little while, it's sort of like a um, um, henna, and it will dye your skin. So we used to use this to paint our nails when we were young children. So they would give stories, or we used to use this as a boat in the water after we were done with it, and we'd use this as a toy. So there's stories that come from these food items, and they just learn together, document it on the board. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's th what you're saying is so important on so many levels. And one of the things I'd just like to pick up on is that idea of the international students in the room becoming the experts. I mean, I think we know most faculty teaching at Conestoga would know there's a push to what we're calling kind of decolonize <laughs> education and pedagogy and the institution as a whole. Um, but that's much easier said than done. And, you know, in theory, of course, I think most people would agree they want to move in that direction. But then when we look at how curriculums have been developed and, you know, textbooks that are out there, there's a certain perspective that's dominant. Um, and so I really love the way that this lesson seems to kind of really put these things into practice. And um, do you find that I mean, you were, you were mentioning, too, that one of the things you try to do is, as educators in this field is model, right? Like there's kind of the curriculum and maybe what's on the instructional plan for the week, but then the behaviors that you're modeling and how that might carry, carry them forward, too. Um, do you notice sort of a shift like in, the, in this week that students start to see each other in a different light if different ones maybe emerge as the experts in, on this topic? Well, certainly just the opportunity for them to speak with students that they might otherwise not have chosen to sit with mm -hmm. uh, will allow for some relationships to develop. And then they might, you know, acknowledge each other in the next class and choose to work together in another class. So it's a, a step in that direction, certainly. I can't say that I've ever measured to establish whether or not that particular experience is effective in shifting relationships or the way that they learn or collaborate. 
That's interesting to me, too, because key to constructivism is, you know, that especially with adult learners, with children, too, but adults have a longer life, <laughs> you know, before they're coming into these programs and more diverse experiences over the years, um, that they're able to kind of bring their full self to the classroom, right? And so this lesson that you're sharing seems to me an opportunity for them, yeah, to share these experiences about, oh, this can also be used as nail polish or as a boat. Mm -hmm. And um, how else would those stories emerge, right? Like they're... Um, and students probably never, you know, expected at the start of the semester that they might have an opportunity to share these things, and yet they have one. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for me as well to get to know them a little bit better, which is important to us in our program. Relationships is the foundation for learning, and so it's just one opportunity to to make sure that those are facilitated with the students, but also with me and the students. Mm. So one of the things that we're um, one of the outcomes, especially for this class, Designing Integrative Curriculum, is that we would support students to provoke wonder and curiosity and intellectual challenge in children mm -hmm. intentionally and uh, using scientific methods or mathematical numeracy and literacy. And so we can see that happening with students and then we can write that outcome and say, Let's review. Let's mm -hmm. think about what you've just experienced. How might you do this when you enter early learning to provoke wonder? Mm -hmm. Their enthusiasm is evident in this particular <laughs> day that I can hear a lot of, um, you know, noises that would suggest that they're happy about the experience. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's easy to point to constructivism after and say, okay, so what does that look like, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's it's so interesting, too, this kind of that, yeah, how you're describing, yeah, they're using the scientific method in this kind of playful, curious, wonder-filled way um, without even, you know, realizing maybe that that's what it is in the moment. And one of the things, I mean, my daughter just started kindergarten, and um, I often note how you know, for early learning, we tend to recognize how important the cognitive, the affective, the psychomotor, how important all of those things are in a child's day. And yet, as students progress through the education system, by the time we get to post-secondary, it seems like most outcomes are focused on that cognitive part, right? And we almost forget that we're affective, deeply feeling people and mm -hmm. need to use our whole bodies. And um, what a beautiful opportunity to, to illustrate that. Absolutely. I really appreciated the word wonderfilled. I'd never heard that before. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. The students have told us at the start of the semester they want opportunities to move. They want to be engaged. And so we're checking in midway and saying, is this enough physical movement? You know, even the act of inviting them to come to the front of the class to access those fruits that are covered mm -hmm. up. I could easily have put it on their table, but they've told me they want to move more. So I physically placed it in the classroom intentionally because we're meeting that physical need to move right. physically and to be engaged meaningfully. So oh. it's all intentional. It shifts over time, this experience, but generally speaking, the, the core of it is, is similar. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, that is one of the advantages too of having a lesson that that you know works and you, you sense is meaningful and memorable for for students and then being able to incorporate it year after year and say okay this time maybe I'm going to cover it up so there's this element of surprise that that's right evokes even greater wonder etc mm -hmm. yeah this year we uh, put the talking head psycho killer Keskase song on <laughs> nice <laughs> that was so fun mm -hmm. well and I mean What's so fascinating is, of course, that's fun, but then also, you know, if you break it down, you think, oh, yeah, now there's this auditory element, too, that um, why not incorporate music? And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, we, for, we forget about how all these things overlap with learning. Sure. At the beginning of the semester, I would ask students some of the questions, you know, what do they like? What's their favorite music? What makes them happy? And so I'd take those forms while they're engaged in this experience and the favorite music, I'd pull it up. And then they'd look Aww. up and they'd say, oh. and I say, I know. <laughs> so we have a moment, you know, where they just look across the room and they say, you put that on for me. Like, that's Aww. my favorite music. One year after this experience, there were some students that were teaching us Bollywood dancing <laughs> at the front of the class. It just becomes this really social, um, delightful, energetic day. 
It's wow. quite beautiful. Mm-hmm. And what a beautiful way to make students, you know, feel welcomed and and heard and understood mm-hmm. to to keep track of those things, right? I, yes. That's very yes. meaningful. One year, the um, I was trying to illustrate the contrast between behaviorism or instructivism more specifically and constructivism. Mm-hmm. So I had introduced a food item that was for him, but just orally before okay. we would actually engage in the experience the following week. And I had introduced a fruit called the durian. Have mm. you heard of it? No, but I like the name. It is beautiful, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But it uh, is, it's kind of like a puffer fish of fruits. It's very spiky and it's large. And in some places in the world, there's actually signs that have this image of this fruit with big spikes on it and a big X through it, like a no smoking sign. Okay. And it's because you're not allowed to eat that food item in these public spaces. And that's because the smell <gasps> is quite fierce. I have heard of this one, right? actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I introduce it orally, and then the next week I'd sort of ask them about the Dorian fruit, just to illustrate, you know, the difference between being told something, not showing pictures or not having great details or experience with it, actively engaging and touching and smelling it, and see what they can remember. And then the, you know, third week after they've actually engaged with unique food items, reassess and show them the difference between instructivism and constructivism. And because I had introduced this durian fruit orally, as we were beginning to explore the following week the real food items, a student was sitting there and she said, I just had a text from a friend, like a student that was in the class, and she said she's in the market and there's a durian. She wants to know if she can pick it up. And I said, yes, sure, tell her I'll give her the money when she gets here. So she brought this durian food to class (laughs) and we opened it up. And it's fierce. The smell is so intense. Is it really? So intense. And some students and I were brave enough and we ate it. And it's sort of this odd experience because I was blocking my nose because the you know smell it and impact. taste, it's yeah, all yeah. so similar and connected. Anyway, this, the classroom was really strong with this odor. And we had to put a big note, note on the whiteboard <laughs> saying... We haven't all simultaneously vomited. (laughs) We ate a durian. We're sorry. Oh, my. Yeah, it was quite unique that the students would participate in that way and saying, can I bring this food to class? So yeah, mm-hmm. wow. And what, so you can see why some places you're not you're not allowed to eat it. Absolutely. Now we know. Mm. Yes. And does the taste, you know, is it different than the smell? Is yes, it? Mm. oddly it is. It's sweet and yummy. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, and it's interesting, too, because you had said a while back that, um, You know, some students kind of are smarter than we are about certain topics and they know more than us or bring a very different perspective. From my experience consulting with a lot of faculty, this is one reason that some people might um, be a little bit afraid of constructivist approaches, I think, to to learning. Um, How do you think, you know, uh, one could maybe get past that and embrace Sure, they're the one in the front of the room, they're, you know, the classroom manager, they're the, the person who's paid to teach other people in that space, um, but also reconciling with the fact that maybe they're not the expert on everything. Mm-hmm. Would you maybe have advice as to how, how folks could, could embrace that? I suppose maybe it's an unfair advantage as an early childhood educator mm-hmm. I would work with uh, young children, and my job wasn't to answer their questions. It was to help them to know how to learn and to investigate. And so this one year, I heard a child say, don't ask Trisha. She doesn't know anything. (laughs) (laughs) And that's because I would say, well, that's a good question. How do you think we can find out? So they thought I was dumb, essentially. And I think because I've had a lot of experience being, you know, perceived as perhaps not the brightest person in the room by young children, I didn't mind it if older people don't. I'm not the expert. You know, we're learning together. And I think it takes a degree of confidence. At the start of my career, there was absolutely the please like me, you Mm -hmm. know, that I've studied and I, I know this, but I was, I think, always quite comfortable coming into the college with um, flexibility and emergent curriculum. That's what we do in early childhood education. And it, 
it's just wonderful, you know, mm -hmm. not knowing where something's going to go because 11 years later I can be teaching, but it's not the same lesson over and over again, which is why maybe I can still enjoy my work as much as I do is because I'm not recycling. I never know what's going to happen mm -hmm. or where the conversations are going to go. And I think it's okay when somebody says that's not right or I'll say to somebody else, know more than this or have a different perspective and then we can learn together. Mm. And that does go back to modeling, you know, what there's the written curriculum and then the, the curriculum on the side sort of that, yeah. And I mean, certainly my daughter who's five, almost five, knows more about certain things than I do, right? And, and to be able to celebrate that is mm -hmm. a, yeah. Um, and I'm curious, Trisha, is there anything, I mean, you've been at the college for a while, is there anything about you that you think maybe students and other colleagues don't yet know that you'd like to share here? Well, maybe that goes back to the please like me. At the start of my career, mm -hmm. I think I'd want to sh share more of myself, and now I want to know really more of students and about students. But I've participated in a lot of professional development at Conestoga and outside of Conestoga. And one in particular stands out with Catherine Brellinger, and that was the um, strategic disclosure mm. and sharing with students intentionally. So when I'm teaching health, safety, and nutrition, and I would be teaching about the determinants of health and how we don't have control over our health necessarily. There are other factors. There I might disclose that I have OCD so that students mm. understand that it's not necessarily, you know, that you don't exercise enough or that you don't sleep well enough and take care of yourself well enough, that our health is impacted by a variety of factors. And similarly, if I'm encouraging students to utilize services at the college, that I might disclose that I'm a first-generation professional and was a first-generation student and saying that I access supports to help me navigate these systems because they're mm -hmm. unique to me. They're, they're not unique. They're um, foreign. They're unfamiliar, and I didn't have a lot of support navigating those systems, just like they might as first-generation students. But um, I guess maybe more of a fun fact Mm -hmm. not strategic disclosure that is intentional to help students uh, feel, you know, connected is that uh, I was uh, at work on my wedding day. So I got married and came to work to teach really? on the same day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Was this like you got married in the morning and then? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. At home, it was a small, intimate. I mean, I'm an introvert, so a big wedding wouldn't be ideal for me. It was just... Uh, yeah, my family and I at home. Did the students know on the day when you arrived at class? <laughs> uh, no, but my daughter, you know, she went to school and she was in kindergarten and she still had her dress on. And they said, why are you dressed so fancy? <laughs> and she said, oh, my parents were married this morning. They said, that's not possible because they already have you. Like, mm -hmm. how could they have been <laughs> not married <laughs> before? So that was funny. They, they might have asked her, but I don't think my students would have known. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's a great story. And, and what you're saying, too, about strategic disclosure mm -hmm. is really quite key. That's a, a really beautiful tactic that, yeah, faculty can use in all sorts of ways. Um, and I really appreciate, yeah, the sharing that you slowly let out, right? It's not necessarily something that, you know, first day, first class, say, here are five facts about me, yes. etc. But, mm -hmm. yeah, as students get to know you, as you become more comfortable with them, as you assess maybe some guidance that they might need or some some more personal stories that could be helpful to them moving forward. Right. You let it out. As it's relevant. You know, in our mm -hmm. program, I've already talked about relationships as a focus. So ideally, you know, um, we would utilize our own experiences. As you mentioned, your child in kindergarten, there are instances where it's really relevant that I could share an example of development from my own child. And uh, my colleagues do the same. So mm -hmm. Most students would know that my colleagues have a child or two children and a little bit about their lives. So mm. when it's relevant, we definitely talk a little bit about that. Well, and it's so, I mean, in many ways, I think it's quite a feminist <laughs> way of teaching too, right? And that there's not this separation between, you know, paid work and domestic work. And if we are taking this constructivist approach and asking students to bring you know, their full selves, letting them know that their full selves and their expertise and perspectives are welcome in the class and there's space for that. Um, 
that seems to be shifting, you know, what, what higher education was once upon a time, I think, in really important ways. I think so. And we want to model that with early childhood educators. There's a shift away from removing oneself from mm -hmm. pedagogical documentation, as an example. We used to say that, you know, you, you're focusing on the child and on development. But now we have learning stories that mm -hmm. really acknowledge that we have a self. The lens that we use to choose what we see is our self. And so obviously we want to encourage students to validate themselves and to make sure that their voice is there and not to have things be so sterile or professional that your own self is not part of it. Yeah. And my sense is that when you do this too, it's a step in the direction of moving us beyond those silos that you were talking about at, at the beginning too, how, you know, you're, you're teaching math using movement and using music and, and, you know, in higher education, I know folks have to choose a program to study and we, we lose a bit of that in the way these things overlap. But, um, you know, to be able to bring that into the classroom in, in small ways or in particular lessons, to me, feels very vital. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Trisha. It has been wonderful to chat with you today. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share before, before we sign off? No, well, I've really appreciated the opportunity to come and talk about something that I love doing. So thank you, Lauren, for the invitation. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you for sharing. And I think, you know, all of these these little touch points that we've we've articulated today will probably resonate in many other programs, too. So thanks so much for being here. You're welcome. Well, we have come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. You can find all episodes in this series and more by following Teaching and Learning at Conestoga on YouTube. You can also find this podcast on Spotify and other places you get your podcasts. If you subscribe, you'll be notified each time a new episode becomes available. For 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our faculty learning hub at tlconestoga.ca. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, reminding you, as the great bell hooks once said, that the classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. Until next time.